On March 19, 2003, when the U.S. initiated its shock and awe policy, sending 2,000 guided missiles into Baghdad over a four-day period, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter had not yet been invented. But there was already a group of terminally online bloggers ready to comment on the illegal and atrocious war. Using the social media site called LiveJournal, before it was sold to the Russians, I constantly posted there, alerting my friends, and most likely the feds, about my scheduled activism. I announced when protest marches were happening, when meetings were taking place, and typed up posts decrying and condemning it all. I learned the lyrics to the International, bought myself a slingshot daily planner, and even tried to learn how to drum in a drum circle. But what I mostly did was condemn friends and family who seemed unconcerned. I remember telling people, if you want to know what you would have done when the Nazis took power, you already have your answer. Nothing. I was convinced that the combination of the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq was tantamount to genocide, and I hoped that, somehow, the United States would lose the war. Badly. Today, we do have Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, TikTok, Instagram, and probably a hundred other and more relevant internet platforms that I've never heard of. And I'm put in the position of watching people who are 20 years younger than I am, and even people who were probably in diapers when the U.S. invaded Iraq, repeat the same rhetoric I deployed to such little effect 20 years ago. Are we on right now? Yeah, we're on right now. Okay, good, good. So do you want me to just basically run down what happened? Uh, yeah, yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, so basically Caleb Moffin put out a tweet earlier saying that third worldists support imperialism. Well, that's an outright lie. The, the entire cornerstone of everything that we are is anti-imperialism, putting anti-imperialism before everything else. Um, so, I mean, whether or not you want to agree with the ideology or not, to say that we support imperialism is a falsehood. All right, so I... I didn't see his tweet specifically, but I think as materialists, we do have to distinguish what an ideologist says their ideology is and the real content of uh, what they're saying at the level of the practical implications, the material implica implications. And the material implications are not about uh, what it would mean for their ideas to be uh, realized on the terms of the ideas, but what it would mean for their ideas to be realized in actual reality, which isn't something that can be controlled by the ideas themselves, if that makes sense. Like, for example, Okay. One can say uh, that they are an anti-imperialist, but because of the specific way they're positioning themselves in relation to real existing imperialism, they can end up serving imperialism. I just want to get something yeah. straight. You're going to fight the military-industrial complex by loving your country. Yeah. When that is what it is. No, this is an undialectical view because... No, no. Yeah. America was born of slavery, racism, genocide, and land theft. All of those things are what made America what it is. Without those things, America does not exist. Is the I'm, I'm asking you, what, what does it mean in 2021 now? Oh, so natives aren't marginalized and have, still have their land stolen. They are, but for example, why would it be incompatible with you. the continuity of the Republic and even the Constitution, for example, for land reparations to be given to uh, Native Americans and for their rights to be up, their treaties to be upholded, and for them to be given more uh, land and more rights and all these self-determination. Why would that not be possible as long as the Republic uh, stands? Because the Republic would still be on their land, even if you, quote, gave them reparations, which, by the way, they don't want. They so want what do they want? Back. This comes from comrade number three, the political the uh, political leader of the Navajo Nation. And this is exactly what he told me, who is a socialist, by the way. And he represents the Navajo people. Yes, but that is the general consensus is, yes, they do want their land back. And even now, we've gone... Okay, what, but hold on. What is their land? What land do they want back? Do they the want, western like, half of the world. They want the entirety of seaboard to seaboard United States. Some of them, yes. With the gift of a little hindsight, after spending a decade and a half as a wannabe Marxist, I'm fairly confident about what's missing from this exchange of ideas. I can see what's gone wrong. For instance, there is little to no mention of political economy, or to put it even more succinctly, what's missing is the question of politics. Of the two interlocutors, Haas is certainly a lot closer to realizing the need for politics 
than Jason Uru. Nonetheless, both are trapped by the ruling ideology that sets us up for what seems like an infinite repetition, perhaps an infinite regress. While Haas does point out that if we're going to create socialism, we'll need to move the American masses, what he leaves out is the need to organize an alternative political project founded on what I'll go ahead and call working class power, despite worrying that this will only compound the general confusion. We are stuck with the consequences of the reification of modern life. The reification of modern life? What does that mean? When we reify a concept or a historical fact, we take it to be natural, to be material in the sense that Jason Uru refers to in this debate. To illustrate the idea, let's take Uru's demand that Turtle Island be returned to the native population as an example. This demand can only be articulated in a post-colonial or bourgeois context. It is a demand that simultaneously insists that native people have property rights and that those rights be respected and insists that the revolution that created those terms of our social existence be undone. Uru references a young man who claims to represent the Navajo people and who he refers to as comrade number three. And this young man claims that the Navajo want to take it all back. He says they want to return to a way of life that does not include property rights, the global market, or capitalist forms of production. But the way of life they want to return to no longer exists, which is why the demands themselves are couched in the language and ideology of the liberal modernity Comrade 3 rails against. The Navajo didn't have forms of property the way we do. Their society wasn't mediated by contracts and individual rights, but by spiritual and cultural practices that arose from a subsistence economy and that included farming, hunting, and the domestication and use of animals. The deindustrialization and economic segregation of Turtle Island is presupposed in this demand. The understanding of materialism that Jason, and to a lesser degree Haas, hold is one that Lenin characterized as vulgar. The notion that material reality can be reduced to the level of what is empirically present to the objects in the world leaves out the social relations that produce and reproduce physical reality. What is left out is the fact that something materially changed due to social changes. The rise of modernity, founded upon the rights and freedoms of labor, the individual right of a laborer to seek work in exchange for a wage, rather than being compelled to work in whatever particular way that his or her tradition demanded, created a whole set of new material facts. Haas's attempt to recontextualize the debate by setting it in the present moment represented a step in the right direction, as it was an attempt to take account of the material change that had occurred, a material change that not only altered the basis for the production and reproduction of society, but that had also changed the character of the individuals within that society. In other words, when we ignore how material reality has changed, as our social relations have changed, if we take property rights to be as transhistorical as gravity, we reify the notion of property. In this conversation between Uru and Haas, it is Haas who is arguing dialectically. And whatever criticism I have of him does not arise as a critique of what he said here. Rather, my only complaint of Haas would be that he remained on the surface of the problem and justified his acceptance of republicanism by referring to the need to use the masses to implement socialism. Instead, we should recognize that a working class that values liberal republicanism, that wants to keep the government at bay, that embraces the Constitution, is more advanced and fully cognizant of reality than Uru or any other socialist who believes that the perfecting of the state can ever be the aim of a working class, socialist party, or movement. Further, the rejection of what's called Western Marxism is a symptom of the regression of socialism. 
understanding the connection between culture and political economy, the entwinement of our self-understanding and identities with the mode of production that creates our material conditions is precisely what Western Marxists, including and especially Frankfurt School Marxists such as Adorno and Horkheimer, attempted to accomplish. The condemnation and rejection of these Marxists by contemporary Marxist-Leninists has left them impoverished and unable to fully take up reality, let alone critique it. And without the ability to critique reality, we are left with repetitions of dead ideologies, arguments that no longer have any connection to the world, but are abstract, self-contained, and mostly symbolic. A symptom of the containment of the anomaly socialist or communist left is the insistence on returning to origins. The question of whether or not the United States could have existed without slavery, or whether the founding of Israel was justified, both operate with a time travel fantasy in the background. They both presuppose that we might be able to go back and fix all the things that have been broken. And as we fantasize about heaven and time machines, the pile of debris generated by modernity and the passage of time continues to grow skyward. To understand how this works or fails to work, let's do a little bit of time traveling in our imaginations and turn back the last 25 years of perpetual disaster. In 1999, I was 28 years old, a struggling fiction writer, the father of two with a job in telemarketing, but I had finally caught a break. My fiction, a story called Instant Labor, was accepted for publication in Amazing Stories. It was about a young man whose job at an answering service trapped him in a bizarre psychic prison. The main character was given the option of plugging directly into the computer. Where is everybody else? I think maybe you're afraid, like, are you a computer person? No, I'm not. I'm, I don't like the... That would be like changing my sex or my political affiliation. I'm not... That's a whole new... In the year 2000, I attended an art exhibit at the Portland Art Museum that had been assembled the year before. It was entitled, Let's Entertain, Life's Guilty Pleasures. The art there had a sensibility that was similar to my fiction. It was optimistically nihilist, making the deadening infantilization inherent to Madison Avenue's promises of eternal youth obvious while remaining soporific itself. Freeze-dried nostalgia delivered the viewer into a state of somnambulance. Life-size puppets, a Barbie dream house you could walk through, video monitors made into lava lamps, and the photography of Cindy Sherman were all on offer for the eye and sometimes the hand. Let's entertain build itself as a pleasure zone of consumer spectacles, even as it insisted that such spectacles were all that the 20th century ultimately delivered. Worse, the 21st century would amount to a stretching of the culture of 1999 into the future, perhaps forever. I was so impressed by the exhibit, both repulsed and attracted to it and its message, that I purchased the exhibition catalog. The book features color photographs of the works from the 50 or so contributing artists, along with interviews, essays, and news articles, including an essay from Grail Marcus analyzing the films of David Lynch, Mike Kelly's diatribe condemning President Clinton for his failure to enact healthcare reform, and an interview of Jonathan Ive on the topic of the new IMAX design. A computer that revived Apple had a bondy blue and translucent white shell and evoked nostalgia for the space age. When asked what expectations he had for the new millennium, I've answered, I think it will be an incredible downer because people will see that nothing has really changed. Jonathan and I have also discussed how the new iMac was meant to be seen as somewhat disposable, like a plastic toy, as this would communicate an idea of fun. However, 24 years later, the iMac, along with the internet itself, is decidedly not fun. Instead, the iMac, with its ice and bondy blue exterior, has become a memento mori for the turning of the millennium. The carcasses of the machines that vindicated Steve Jobs 
now only serve as reminders of the underbelly of the Clinton era's optimism. The not-so-secret nihilism that came along with the joyous pronouncement that history had ended. Ah, the good old iBook G3 clamshell. But I don't remember them smelling this much like vinegar. And... Yeah. A lot of old electronics are starting to die. However, as these old iMacs die, it may be time to reevaluate the pessimism of Let's Entertain. Certainly I's prediction that the 21st century would only demonstrate to us how nothing has changed, was proven to be wrong. Instead, what the 21st century has demonstrated is how much change can accumulate even as everything stays the same. The year 2000 was a time still defined by monoculture. It was a time when Dara Birnbaum's Wonder Woman and Kiss the Girls Make Them Cry found footage montages of network television could be taken up as critiques of the culture rather than as more content in a society that no longer had a culture. It was a time when an artistic critic could write about blurry fonts as a new trend indicating a shift had occurred in our understanding or sensibility, whereas today, the idea that we could share a collective sensibility is cringe. This future, designed as a spectacle to entertain us, has aged badly. Even more, the initial premise of the critique Let's Entertain intended to deliver has been buried under a mountain of content, and in this way, it has been overturned. The promise of the Let's Entertain exhibit was that, as Richard Shusterman put it in the companion catalog, we could come back to pleasure. Shusterman, who is described by Wikipedia as an American pragmatist, bemoans the disappearance of pleasure as a motivator for the creation of art. And he particularly points his finger at Theodore Adorno as the worst of the new grumpy Puritans of modernity. He quotes Adorno's ascetic theory, quote, In a false world, all hedonism is false. This goes for artistic pleasure too. Art should not seek pleasure as an immediate effect. What works of art really demand from us is knowledge, or better, a cognitive faculty of judging justly. Shusterman understands Adorno's rejection of contemporary pleasures to be just another step down the road of the sacralization of art that began with Hegel, that philosopher who subordinated art to spiritual truth. However, far from mystifying art and spurning pleasure in the name of truth, Adorno aimed to critique the society that reduced pleasure to the level of a stimulus response mechanism. For Adorno and the other Frankfurt School philosophers, the question wasn't whether pleasure was worth pursuing, but rather was, can we even speak of pleasure when there's nobody left, no thinking, self-responsible and self-understanding subject left to experience it? In 1938, Theodore Adorno characterized the question of whether an audience liked or disliked a concert or work as primitive. If you ask a listener whether or not he or she likes or dislikes a given song or performance, the ideological machine, or as Adorno puts it, the commodity character of the music, will determine the answer. Rather than discovering anything about the individual's understanding and appreciation of the song, you instead only discover how well the song fits the formula of the industrialized musical product. The contemporary consumer doesn't actually listen to, let alone consciously comprehend, the music she encounters and purchases, either with attention or with money. But instead, the music acts upon the listener, conforming her to its demands and creating market expectations. Adorno's cultural Marxism applies Marx's category of the commodity fetish to industrial culture, or the culture industry. And he claims that our politics are produced in the same manner as a pop song, a movie, or even a YouTube video. Capitalism has developed and transformed itself through various attempts to maintain society as it is, despite its inner contradiction, which can be summarized this way. We produce mass poverty through an abundant glut of commodities. As we moved from Fordism to neoliberalism, and now to what some are calling techno-feudalism, or more accurately, if less descriptively, post-neoliberalism, our politics have been absorbed and reabsorbed by the culture industry. 
This has made understanding the Frankfurt School critique of culture, made understanding cultural Marxism difficult. And it is the mediation of politics by the cultural industry that explains why, on the left, we are so often presented with an unironic embrace of Stalinism along with the Manichaean or Schmidian form of anti-imperialism. We do not think about politics, but only like this or that political position, party, ideology, or content creator. We do not organize ourselves to overcome the contradictions of society, but act in a mechanical way as we are stimulated by this or that catastrophe to back one or another band of technocrats, select from this or that policy aimed at managing and also perpetuating the crisis. In his last essay entitled Resignation, Adorno wrote, The administered world has a tendency to strangle all spontaneity, or at least to channel it into pseudo-activities. This is made easier for the individual by his capitulation to the collective with which he identifies himself. He is spared from recognizing his powerlessness. The few become many in their own eyes. This act, not unwavering thought, is resignative. The sense of a new security is purchased with the sacrifice of autonomous thinking. And then Adorno says, at this time, no higher form of society is concretely visible. For that reason, whatever acts as though it were an easy reach has something regressive about it. Let me tell you another secret, guys. Marxism won. Okay? When someone like Haas claims he is speaking from the realm of eminence, we should understand him as admitting that he is taking society up on the terms already given. When he claims that his guerrilla army doesn't operate on the level of the ego, we should understand him to be restating what Judith Butler argued during COVID-19. Uh, but right. there might be an ethics that's beyond calculation. In other words, I'm thinking about my life, which means others are thinking about it in the same way, right. and we are linked in this living world, in this on this planet, right. right? Which is why the interdependency that we need to understand to fight COVID is also the interdependency we need to understand to fight climate destruction. I agree. And so agree. In, in, we need a, I, I would call it a communist ontology. Yeah, I think we need a radical social ontology. We need to rethink selfhood, its boundaries, its openings, to have a, a completely different ethics and, 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 and a politics of care. Uh, so I'm I'm pushing against the personal liberty folk right now. Yeah, no, I Sorry, I know I know that's extreme. A... Namely, that individual reasons should be suppressed in the name of a collective morality that, as we saw at the time, would be dictated to us by the capitalist state. The fact that Haas prefers China to the United States is of little consequence. We should, in fact, understand the United States and China to be interlocked, mutually dependent and ultimately working to maintain the same global system. When we forsake our individual egos, when we toss aside the old imperative to think autonomously, we let the historical process that capitalism determines do our thinking for us. The fact that we find ourselves in opposition to other political factions should not persuade us of our independence from capitalism, as capitalism functions through these manufactured oppositions. Again, in 1999, I attended an art exhibit called Let's Entertain Life's Guilty Pleasures. What was obvious, even then, was that the guiltiest of pleasures was a pleasure we all took in our collective passivity and thoughtlessness. The pleasure we took as we abandoned our desires to a process that only promised that nothing would change. One of the contributors to the exhibit summed up what was happening, what the art of 1999 promised would happen this way. The way we um, absorb information and experience is so radically different than you know uh, decades in the past. And you know the idea now that you know there is the kind of organic space, you know the, the tactile one when I can walk outside and you know put my hand on the ground and touch the snow today, versus um, you know I can feel my pocket ringing and I can open up and there's an image of the snow falling. The idea of experiences um, become less singular and more collective. 
um, the idea of the straight story becomes increasingly broken and things are, are, are fragmented. What happens then is really each of us are authoring our own film in real time and that film is the hour that we live in, the day that we live in, the life that we live. And that's a subtotal of all the fragments around us, whether they're tactile or synthetic. What Aitken leaves out of his explanation is that rather than the fragmented character of our lives indicating that we're liberated from a monoculture that would have us conform, we are rather conforming to a process of fragmentation. Today we offer up films of our lives to the machine, just as he described, but all the films look more or less the same. And even worse, we have reached the point where the machine will make these films for us, tailored to the needs and desires that have been programmed into us by the culture industry. To return to the beginning, one of the desires we have programmed into us is the desire to time travel, the desire to go back in time, fix things, and achieve justice. But what this desire obscures is that we are always time traveling, only not backwards. We are always being moved forward into a future that promises to continue the disasters of the past. Our task, however, is not to merely witness and judge this time travel, but to change it. <laughs>